I finally broke the one second barrier, meaning we can now compute Matt Parker's five words with 25 characters in under a second. How did I do that? So remember from last time the important optimization. If we start at some word, let's say Monty, then we don't want to linear, linearly scan for the first word that doesn't collide with Monty. That would be slurp in our case. Instead, we build a lookup table that said, I want to immediately know which is the first word or how far apart is the first word that doesn't collide with Monty. That's eight apart and 86 plus eight is 94. And later I realized there's really no reason for these relative offsets. So now I store them as absolute indices and we named it from first step to first. Okay, um, cool. So now we have the first word Monty, the second word uh, slurp, and then we con can continue with the other words. And then later, if we want to um, change the second word to a different word, then we have to linearly scan again because the optimization was only for the very first step. And that's quite expensive because you can see all these words here have an O and we have to scroll down um, quite a bit. It would be much nicer if we had a second lookup table, a two-dimensional lookup table where we could say, um, I want to find a word that doesn't collide with Monty, but I don't want to start looking at Monty. I want to start looking at slurp plus one. So basically here at slotty. Why do we have to start at slotty? If we start at slurp, then we find slurp <laughs> because it doesn't collide with Monty already. Okay. And indeed I implemented this two dimensional lookup table. It tells us uh, the next word is at 171. And let me mark all those words down to 171. That's quite a lot of words. There we go. So all these marked words can now also be skipped, which previously wasn't possible. Previously we had to perform a linear scan. Okay. And that's the word lurks. And it just so happens that the next word also fits, but then uh, we have to jump over 30 words again. So this should uh, save quite some time. Okay, so that's the basic idea. I hope that makes sense. Again, uh, the one dimensional lookup table is quite constrained. It only says what word doesn't collide with Monty starting with Monty. And the two dimensional lookup table says what word doesn't collide with Monty starting with an arbitrary word. And that's why we can use it uh, all the time and not just for the first step. Okay, so then let's look at the code, what changed in the code. So first here, our hmm, relative step is now an absolute index. So we no longer have to add the relative offset to I, we can just use it as an absolute index. Cool. Um, so the example here is if I is the Monty word, then J will be the slurp word, just as uh, explained. Okay, and then later, what do we do if we want to find the next word after slurp? First, we increment J, then J is at slotty. And then we look in the two dimensional table and it will tell us the first word after slotty or at or after slotty that doesn't collide with Monty is lurks. Okay, and then we can always just use the word and combine it with A. We don't have to perform any additional uh, checks. We are guaranteed by the first lookup table and the skip lookup table that we won't have um, collisions between A and B. Okay, and then for the later innermost loops, it's a bit more complicated. So we go to the next word, then we find a word starting from there that doesn't collide with A, and then we find a word starting from there um, that doesn't collide with J. So the K++ guarantees progress and the last assignment guarantees that K doesn't collide with J, but it could still collide with I, right? So after this assignment, it won't collide with I, but after this assignment, it may again collide with I. We can't um, know that in general. Okay, and that's why we have the old uh, if comparison here and the continuous. So these three modifications of K may happen more than once before we find um, before we find good candidates or a good candidate for K. Okay, and of, here, of course here the pattern continues. So L++ guarantees progress and then we want to find a word that doesn't collide with I, uh, later doesn't collide with J, later doesn't collide with K. And again, uh, we are only guaranteed that it doesn't collide with K because of the order of assignments here. And then we have to check and continue again. And this may happen multiple times. And similarly here for <laughs> these four assignments, I think now you see the pattern. Okay, so lots of words can be skipped immediately and that's what makes it quite fast. 
So now let's look at how this skip table is initialized or computed. Here you can see it, it's quite a big two dimensional lookup table. I estimated it at about 50 megabytes. That's quite a lot. It's more or less quadratic. It's just one more wide than it is high. And it will become obvious in a minute why, why I did that. Um, yeah, and then we go through all the words for the first dimension. And then at the very end, at the additional index, we store, yeah, basically at the last index, we store the last index. <laughs> we have to do that because these um, modifications of our loop counters may um, increment them to the, yeah, to 5176. There's no valid data at that index. And then accessing at that index would otherwise yield an array index out of bounds exception. So th this is just a sentinel value that guarantees once we go beyond the last meaningful word, we stay there and don't provide any exceptions or provoke any exceptions. Okay, then we fetch the word and then we loop um, through our words backwards. Uh, it will become obvious why we do that. Then we fetch the word and then we say, what's the useful skip value? So if the two words do uh, not intersect, then we can simply say, okay, this J word is, is a perfect candidate. It already doesn't intersect. We don't do, have to do anything else. Otherwise, we simply copy the value from our right neighbor. That's, uh, that's why we fill it from right to left. If we filled it from left to right, <laughs> then we would need another linear search from left to right, and that would make it um, much more expensive. So that's a common trick. Does this already count as dynamic programming, filling it from right to left because these answers <laughs> inform the answers on the left? I don't know. Maybe it's already dynamic programming. <laughs> Feel free to chime in the, in the comments. Okay, and then interestingly, our first array is simply, yeah, more or less a copy of the diagonal in our quadratic two-dimensional array, right? And you may think, hmm, do we then even need this one-dimensional first array? Can't we simply, here, instead of saying first i, can't we simply say skip i of i and uh, so on for j, k, and l? Yeah, you could absolutely do that. The problem is that this diagonal um, isn't linearly stored in memory. <laughs> All these lines of the array are who knows where in memory. And if we copy it once in one linear region, then uh, going through it more or less from left to right with a couple of jumps in between is much more friendly to, you know, today's CPU and cache architectures. So I measured this and uh, without our first array, if we just use skip i and i, I get about a 20% performance decrease. Um, yeah, you can measure on your own system what happens if you replace this with skip i, i and similarly um, here for j, here for k, and um, here for l. Yeah, and you may also wonder why am I using a short array instead of an int array? Um, normally, I rarely use shorts in Java, but in very big arrays, it makes sense because having you know, if a 50 megabyte array is much better than having a 100 megabyte array because, again, we have quite random access patterns here in our two dimensional array. And the smaller the array is, the more likely it is that the cache is still hot and you, you don't have to wait um, uh, for the data to be fetched. And again, this was about a 20% performance decrease if I didn't use short. Again, feel free to check that on your own computer if you replace the these two shorts with an int, and then you can leave out this guy and this guy. Um, how much slower is it then on your computer? Okay, but even if you don't change any of the code, <laughs> feel free to measure on your own computer. Um, you super users with 16 core 32 thread CPUs don't expect too much. So I got a three times performance increase. I would expect less on your computers because remember that all the initial stuff, um, reading the files and filtering and mapping and sorting, removing the distincts and then initializing all these tables. All that is done on a single core. So you can only benefit from your 16 cores, 32 threads um, when the when the main loop here starts basically. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe twice as fast instead of three times as fast. I don't know. <laughs> Let me know in the comment section below.